Hey guys, Sean here. Welcome to the F1 word and to the debrief for the 2024 Saudi Arabian Grand Prix. How are we all doing this fine evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you are in the world? I uh, hope you're doing well. Very much looking forward to this. Quite quite surprised at how much I've got in my notes. Six pages worth. I think we've got quite a bit to talk about tonight. We will be talking, of course, about the top three teams, including uh, Schrodinger's Jumpstart. Uh, we'll also be talking... <laughs> I'm so proud of that. I just am. Weird. Uh, we're also going to be talking, of course, about strategy, uh, the Haas situation with Kevin Magnus, and I'll do the rundown as well so we get through every single team at some point we'll also take some of your questions and your comments a little bit later as well i'm sure you've all got some opinions uh, on the weekends i'm gonna say action some people would say there was no action but i disagree i think i think i've said in also just about everybody i've spoken to i would rate that slightly higher than bahrain if you're giving it a score and um, but it looks as though in the poll which is in chat again uh, average slash okay seems to be winning out at the moment so I, I would say slightly better than bahrain i think there seems to be more action or something more to keep me interested uh, i think for much of the race and it didn't feel like a quite so anticlimactic but we're not going to get into the negatives just just yet um <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure I'll find some negatives and come to them at some point. Uh, let's start there by saying a very good evening to Stuart again. Uh, second one in a row, Stuart. How are you doing? Still doing well. Uh, things good. are still going uh, <laughs> kind of as they were in Bahrain, I think, other than some um, key differences. Um, yeah, it was all right, wasn't it? It wasn't a classic, but it wasn't a complete snooze fest. There were some bits going on, and I, I think Oliver Behrman absolutely helped the narrative of the race a lot. Let's let's not forget that. But yeah, how about you? A proper feel-good story, Ollie Behrman, wasn't it? I think kept everybody invested in the race. But yeah, I'm, I was just saying at the start there, I think for me, uh, well, I'm okay. Thank you for asking. But <laughs> just skip over. <laughs> I'm terrible. No, um, I, I was saying that if I was giving this a score, you know, out of 10, I'd probably rate this higher than Bahrain. But if I'm just picking between the four options in the poll, I'm probably going to say sort of okay, uh, middle of the road. I don't think it was terrible, but I don't think it was uh, one that I'll be remembering too fondly. Apart from, of course, for Ollie Behrman's... Um, debut which we will get to that's second on my list believe it or not um because um, basically the same as last week for anyone was here last week so we're going to kind of format it the same see how we go uh, but we will start with red bull and i think that could be the theme of the season to be honest Stuart. Uh, we'll start with red bull um it was i mean fair to say i would say anyway fairly comfortable um the gaps weren't as big as they were in bahrain but we did have the safety car how much they were pushing, I don't think we'll ever know. Um, you know, Verstappen, I guess if we're being generous, had to work for it a little bit more this week. Uh, you know, demanding track physically, but also he had to overtake Lando Norris on old tyres whilst he was on nice new tyres in an extremely fast <laughs> car. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't as comfortable as it was last week in terms of the times and the fact he had to pass somebody, but it still felt pretty damn comfortable, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, uh, to, to me, it still kind of felt as comfortable as it, as it really got. They're definitely sitting in their own little pocket on Red Bull at the moment. And I don't think there was any time when Verstappen was doubting that he was he was going to win this. Um, so yeah, I mean, what can you say? They are just in a class of their field. They occasionally give us a little bit to, to question in, in some of the earlier sessions or uh, some of the free practice or... or um, earlier bits of qualifying, although Verstappen did sweep all three uh, qualifying uh, sessions this weekend, but he wasn't on top of every single free practice session. The FP2 went to Alonso. So every now and again, it give, you, you're, you're allowed yourself a little bit of, oh, maybe someone's got a little something up their sleeve, but Red Bull always have more up their sleeve. Yeah, you get you get your TV coverage and your your media outlets, don't you? Going, oh, it's anyone's game, and you sort of sat there on Friday night going, nah, <laughs> it's really not anyone's game. But that, to be honest, actually, that was probably the biggest disappointment for me of the weekend was the fact that we saw in Bahrain, Quali was ludicrously close, and Max Verstappen was actually quite comfortable over one lap this weekend. I actually had Charles Leclerc down in my predictions as a pole position because I thought, you know, looking back to last week, how close they were, I thought, oh, this could be quite exciting. And Quali was exciting because it often is, but it it he never really looked under threat for pole is kind of my point. And then in the race, even though it wasn't perhaps as dominant as, as the numbers would show as Bahrain was, it, it still, as you say, never really felt like he was going to lose that. And 
I think that's the theme of the season. And I'm, I'm you know, I always say I'm never going to tear a, a team down for doing a, a great job on track. You know, it's up to the other teams to catch up. And if they can't do it, then maybe that's where the criticism needs to be on track. We'll put it that way. Um, and we are sticking with on track this weekend with, with this week with Red Bull, by the way. We, we talked enough about that last week. Uh, <laughs> I'm not getting into it going here for hours. But yeah, I mean, my notes, are, it's nothing against Verstappen, but I've got not an awful lot in my notes other than physical race, overtook Norris, Norris, um, did well to to build a gap and and that was kind of it. I think I think helping him on the first lap was certainly the Perez and Leclerc scrap. That seemed to cost him a bit of time, but I feel like he would have pulled a second on the first lap anyway, realistically. But uh, do it? Do we think, chat? Do we think, Stuart, that this is going to be another Red Bull romp to the title, or do you think we're we're, we're going to get a surprise in the coming weeks? Because we've got some different. Tra- I think China could be a bit of a curveball. Nobody's been there since 2019, and we've got a sprint as well. So there could be there could be something there, um, but it might say a lot about the start of the season that much of the race was focused on um, Sonoda and Ricardo in Bahrain and Magnussen in Saudi Arabia. And I'm already looking for races where things might be a bit different. <laughs> yeah, it's th- th- there's a little bit of uh, concerning uh, <laughs> um, deja vu about the way this season is going. But I like to keep my optimistic goggles on. And I I will keep saying that at the beginning of the season, it's important to remember that this is just sort of the starting platform for these teams and their cars. And there is opportunity for any of them to kind of unlock something or bring like phase two of their development package and close up the gap to Red Bull or the other teams around them. And that, you know, maybe Ferrari, McLaren, Mercedes, Aston Martin, any of those teams could do a better job after this first blitz of races at, at developing their car and, and closing that, there could be better teams uh, by the time we get to Europe. There is a, there is a chance this, these things could sort of turn around. We've seen seasons that have two halves before. I think I, I think we may be stretching if we think the Red Bull could be caught for the title because I think if Red Bull lay down five great races before we get back to Europe um, and really just extend the enormous gap they built already then you know it's going to be a big ask but in terms of a race on race basis there could be some interesting things ahead we don't necessarily know it's going to be a complete red bull wash yet after after two races but yeah you <laughs> you look at two one twos in a row and you've got to be going uh, yeah <laughs> are we going to have another year of this yeah but like it's like i say it's up to the teams to step up isn't it at the end of the day it's red bull have built the best car they've got the best car and driver combination so Crack on Ferrari, Mercedes and co. You know, sort yourselves out. <laughs> Give us some race to get the front. It's all right battling the midfield, but it's uh, we'd like to see some at the front from time to time. But Sergio Perez, actually, I think, contrary to a, a lot of what I've read, actually, Stuart, I thought had a, a pretty good weekend. I think it was solid in qualifying. Um, good race, finished P2, which I will always maintain as, you know, whether people like it or not, the second driver at Red Bull. That's what he needs to be doing. And that's exactly what he did. And... Um, I think drove really well, you know, got his five second penalty, built the gap he needed to keep Charles Leclerc behind when that was added to his race time at the end of the race. Also uh, did a bit of overtaking himself. I-, I think drove drove really well. I think the only the only negative, apart from the penalty that I put on his weekend, is is that he didn't lock out the front row of Verstappen. But as we know, throughout his career and also looking back at last season, qualifying isn't always his strong suit. So if he's qualifying third, third, fourth every weekend and still finishing second, then it doesn't really matter. Points are on a Sunday, aren't they? Or a Saturday, as it was for the first two races. But I think he drove really well. So I'm not quite sure why um, people talk him down. I don't know if it's just people have decided he's no good and he shouldn't be in that car. But I, I think he did all right. I've got, I've not got, again, apart from the penalty and the fact he didn't end up on the front row, but still finished second in the race, I've got nothing massively negative on Perez. Yeah, it's a bit of a repeat again, isn't it? Uh, of last weekend, he's kind of maximised... What he, what he could do on race day, he overtook to get himself up into second, um, which is, I kind of think realistically, probably as far as he was ever going to get Max. And yeah, a solid race, good pace, wasn't really challenged once he got up into into second place behind um, Verstappen on lap four, I want to say, looking at the lap chart. Um, there is a, and again, this isn't something that Red Bull will necessarily be um, losing sleep over, but I, 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 I'm wondering... Once he gets into second, and by that point, he's normally five or six seconds behind Verstappen where he kind of stays because Verstappen controls the race from there. If he ever thinks, I want to go for the win, like if it ever, mm. if it's if it crosses his mind at all, 
you know, could I put my foot down, close the gap and, and go for this? And or if he just once he gets to second, he's like, well, this is my race now because he knows if he tries to make some inroads on on Max, then Max will just pull away again because he's probably um, controlling the pace at the front. So yeah, I wonder what the ambition is there if uh, Perez or if he just knows kind of where he belongs in the team and in the ranking and in his ability. Um, but in terms of what was expected of him and what he realistically could deliver out on track, I, th- I think he did. He maximized. I'm going to sound like I've got no ambition when I say this. <laughs> so apologies straight away. Um, if I were in Perez's position this season, bearing in mind how parts of last season went and his contracts up at the end of the year, I would just max. I would just make sure that I am second, third place to Max, and not rocking the boat too much, and just show that I'm still arguably the better option than, say, a Ricardo or a Sonoda over the course of a season. That's what I'd be doing until that contract signed, and then thinking, right, then Max, let's have a go, and then giving it everything, and then sitting in a corner sobbing at the end of the race because I'm 35 seconds behind. But um, you know, <laughs> I'd at least try. But I mean, look, eight point six seconds i think it was before his penalty yeah 8.6 seconds before his penalty was applied so 13.6 officially but 8.6 on on the road that's not horrific but again we have to look at this is a strong tr- track for checo so you'd expect him to be closer to max here but also how hard was verstappen pushing i mean fairly hard on the last lap did a 131.7 uh, leclerc with the fastest up 131.6 so he was pushing but there's there's so many question marks over just how hard these because you know they've got such an advantage now there's no point burning your power units right now or burning through them now and regretting at the end of the season you may as well look after them and see how far you can get them and then you're sitting pretty if things do get closer but uh, i think that's all on red bull uh <laughs> i don't really know what else uh to say if i'm being honest other than again congratulations to them um and cracking job i suppose but the story of the weekend was probably, uh, in fact, it wasn't probably, it absolutely was, um, Mr. Oliver Bearman, uh, <laughs> or Bearman, if you prefer. <laughs> um, I will start this by saying, first of all, Carlos Sainz um, had his surgery. It was successful, as he described it, a smooth operation. Very, Very good, nice. sir. Very good. Uh, so he was all good. He was at the track, actually, on Saturday. Um, a bit sore, by all accounts, but already looking towards Australia um, and Fred Vassura said that the that he's optimistic sites will be in the car for Albert Park but they'll make a decision obviously next week they're not going to decide today are they but next week um, so obviously get well soon to Carlos Sainz I, I know people have had appendicitis and surgery and it's, it's not very nice and obviously you know people say oh he should be back for Australia because Alex Albon went from Italy had his surgery and then went to Singapore the toughest race of the year but you have to remember we're all human and we all recover at different times at different rates and in different ways so it, it might be ready for australia sounds optimistic but it could be uh japan a few weeks later but either way the important thing is that he gets well soon and uh gets back in that car because it could start in bahrain so it'd be good to see him uh, back out mm. there but ollie bearman i mean what a debut i, I don't think it's i a lot of hype around him and i think it, it's great to to see that and i think it's fair you know he got in the car in fp3 a delayed fp3 was or not delayed the interrupted with red flag so shortened time in fp3 hit all the targets they wanted to hit did everything he needed to do in fp3 then qualified 11th and was a whisker away from the top 10 which is is incredibly impressive and then gets in the race i don't i think i think david coulthard and cohen commentary were screaming contact between him and sonoda at one point i'm not convinced there was much if any at all there um kept it clean delivered the race he had to good on strategy his first pit stop went off without a hitch as well by all accounts i'm not seeing anything say anything different uh and i just think a superb drive all weekend and what really impressed me Stuart, was actually how how calm he was how cool he was about everything because I, I it'd be so easy at 18 years old first f1 race jumping in the second quickest car on the grid it'd be so easy to get flustered or make a mistake and stick it in the wall or crash with someone but it was so cut particularly on that first lap he was aggressive but he was he was calculated in everything he did and i was just really impressed with how you know it's the whole mature head on young shoulders thing i hate the phrase in many ways but it does sort of make sense but i was just generally impressed with him i guess is my my summary for ollie Behrman. <laughs> yeah i agree i think he did everything they needed him him to do with such a big ask and such short notice i mean i hate being invited out for drinks at, at too late notice it really throws me off my yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, and yet to 
have to pull off this monumental task in front of uh, millions of, of people and as, as well as your potential future employees. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, what, what a big feat he had. But no, I think he did great. Obviously, you know, cu- you know, a couple of little mistakes that you could brush off that are just, you know, normal, pushed a bit too hard there, maybe had a bit of problems. He was a bit unlucky in qualifying and how he got caught up in a bit of traffic here. Alonso pushed in front of him when he was about to do a hot lap at one point and then there were red flags when he was trying to do it, you know, things like that, which, I mean, a lot of things happened that weren't very helpful to him. So to come within the squeak of Q3 and then um, have the race he did was um, phenomenal, really. And I must also say, I think Ferrari did a great job with him. You heard them a lot on the radio, just, you know, keeping him calm, tempering expectations, getting him to warm up to where he needed to be, not rushing everything and not trying to do any heroics, which, you know, there have been variations of Ferrari in times gone by that would have um, maybe pushed a bit too hard and not done the coaching uh, needed to to get him in the right headspace and make him feel feel confident. So I think, you know, together they worked uh, really well. And I, I think they should be very proud of, of what they managed to do. Um, and it's, you know, with, I think he's got six free practice slots with Haas during this yes, year. Yeah. I think this, this is the year he absolutely sets out his stall for um, grabbing a seat next year. Um, yeah, I was, I, I was very impressed. And I was also very impressed with science for coming in on, on the Saturday, the day after surgery, to be honest, I would have uh, done what everyone else does and stayed in bed and photoshopped a photograph of me and my family and sent that out. Oh, don't get me started on that. Oh my God. <laughs> Like, who cares? For goodness sake, get a grip, UK. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, that's that's for the Royal uh, stream that we do after this. Uh, we do not. Uh, yeah, well, I look, I, I just think now when you were talking about, you know, coaching and things like that, that could be something Fred Vasseur's brought to the team because he's, you know, he's got that experience, hasn't he, with junior drivers over the years. So I just wonder if that's something that he's brought to the team uh, to help coach. Uh, young drivers and that maybe is going to be a benefit for Ollie Behrman so I mean his tyre management I've written here in that long final stint was really good I was absolutely certain Norris and Hamilton would just come and swallow him up I thought they'd be right on the back of him and straight yeah. past um, but his pace was really good and actually I don't know what happened on the final lap um, I couldn't find anything to confirm it but he was seven tenths quicker than Norris on the final lap and 1.2 quicker than Hamilton whether they backed off across the line or anything I don't know but he his pace was really good at the end and that was his personal best so there was still more to give um, and, you know, four tenths slower than Max Verstappen on the final lap, who was going for fastest lap. That's really good, really good. And there has been a lot of hype. Um, and I am going to be Mr. Typical Sean. Um, I have to look at the other side just for the sake of balance. But I don't want it to take away from his performance. Uh, yeah, F2 is not F1, but he did do practice and quality in F2 before FP3. So he's got his eye in at the track at the very least. And, you know, that car is the second quickest out there. But at the end of the day, he's hopped in. I would argue, and I don't think many will disagree, the most high-pressured environment in F1 in a Ferrari uh, at mm-hmm. extremely short notice and picked up six points on his debut and qualified very close to the top 10, not far off making Q3. That's still impressive to me. And I think people do need to calm down a little bit with the... I've seen a lot of, oh, you know, Lance Stroll's got a seat. How does Ollie Behrman not have one? It's like, guys, it's one race. You know, and 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 Stroll and Behrman, their, their paths aren't going to cross in terms of driver transfer. Uh, it's unlikely Oli Behrman's going to go anywhere near that second out Aston Martin seat. So, you know, they've got their options and their own junior drivers. So I don't know why we have to connect the two, but people do seem to need to. But it's it's one race. We'll we'll see what happens. But six FP1 sessions with Haas, that performance on Saturday in particular. I would be very surprised if he's not somewhere on the grid next year. Maybe we'll get into this later in the stream, actually. We'll do the race stuff first. But I am wondering, with that performance and if he imp- impresses in the FP1 sessions, why we're just talking about Haas. There are quite a few seats open. Um, and I'm looking at, in particular, RB and the whole situation with Norris a few years ago when McLaren were in a position where they either gave him a race seat or he was free to talk to other teams. Could Ollie Behrman maybe team up with Liam Lawson at RB, you know, for example? I sort of don't want him to because he's a Ferrari junior. I'd like another Ferrari junior to come through, but just a, just a thought for maybe later in the stream uh, to ponder for everybody. Um, I'm also really disappointed I've not used the, uh, the pun, it's worth bearing in mind, um, which is really, really annoying. But yeah, <laughs> 
I, I don't I, I sort of put that other side across as balance because I think you sometimes have to just take a step back and remember that the other facts in the weekend but um that that should never detract from his performance because you know what was I doing at 18 probably drunk on a park bench somewhere I mean I had a home but, <laughs> you know he, he's doing that on a Saturday you know it's just it, it's fantastic yeah and I think you know in a sort of maybe uh just to counter the balance again <laughs> um yeah he was in a ferrari second fastest car and, and and that and he had already got pole in a in f2 and, and and so on he wasn't coming in completely blind but some of the commentary were sort of saying as we were leading into fb3 talking about you know what he'd be able to do that they would be you know impressed if he wasn't 20th coming in, in, in fb3 and i and i thought about that i thought oh that's a funny thing to say but the more i thought about it i thought well yeah i mean yeah the ferrari is the second fastest car but this is a bun this is a tight we forget this it's a tight field these last two seasons have been a very uh uh t- t- yeah the performance between the the best and the worst it's not huge like it has been in in some seasons so you know if he hadn't quite uh found you know he got got happy in that car uh, with, between the car and the track which is you know significantly different to how the f2 car performed if you know, if he hadn't quite worked it all out, he could have been a second or so slower than what he was actually able to do. And yeah, and, and then not made it out of Q Q one, been last in in practice stuff. You know, that is a possibility that that could have happened. And I think if that had had, had happened, though, uh, we shouldn't have been too hard on him for it. So to actually be able to be pretty competitive through every session he did um, is is very impressive. I will also. I'm also cu- curious. Actually, there is a there is a chance he won't be last in the standings at the end of the year, even if he never sits in that seat again. I think a very good chance he won't be. No offense to the likes of you know Logie Sargent, as we called him in testing. Um, I'd be surprised if he picks up more than a couple of points this season, Logan Sargent, if that. Um, also, actually, no, it's a good point though because point scoring. We were talking about this last week, weren't we? It's going to be tough this year for some teams further back because if the top five teams are all finishing in the points, that's the points locked out. So, you know, he, he could... Yeah, no, you've got... And that message you sent me, it's weird seeing him higher in the F1 standings than the F2 standings. Yeah. <laughs> it's just it's all It's all gone topsy-turvy. <laughs> uh, it has... I mean, it's interesting that it has really put him on the back foot in F2. <laughs> because <laughs> he's now scored zero points from the first mm. two rounds um but obviously he'd take that um his in terms of his value um that's that's gone right up but yeah interesting see what he can do from there in f2 uh sighted canvas says did you see uh the camera on ollie's dad every five seconds with ferrari ceo standing behind him now that's pressure yeah he he looked he looked he looked how my dad looks when he's passenger in my car actually <laughs> He looked terrified. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no, it's it was good to see him there as well, and and John Elkin or Elkan was there as well, wasn't he? So um, big pressure environment, but I think he handled it extremely well. Uh, we will we'll do some speculation later. I know some of you enjoy it, some of you don't, but we'll do it anyway. But I need to put some big breaking news to you all. Um, Charles Leclerc was there this weekend as well. What? <laughs> Ferrari. There was a second Ferrari on track. Um, and I actually, I think, a, a really good drive. P3. Um, he said the maximum anyone can realistic, realistic, they expected to achieve. And I've said maximum anybody can realistically expect to achieve at the moment, assuming no issues uh, for either of the Red Bulls. Uh, he was 4.9 behind. So that's 9.9 off Perez. If we include, if we take the penalty back off, 18 off the lead. It's not awful for Charles Leclerc. And I'd say Ferrari, sort of where they were in Bahrain with Carlos Sainz in terms of gap to the Rebels. It felt obviously Carlos Sainz was close to Perez, but you know what I mean? I didn't I didn't ever feel like Ferrari were going to challenge for the win, but I never felt like his podium was under any real threat. So I think really good drive and a good way to bounce back, actually, after all the brake issues in Bahrain. I know they weren't his, his fault, but that can be frustrating. And sometimes drivers might try a bit harder at the next race to make up for that. But I think he just drove the race he had to drive. Um, realistically, knew he wasn't going to challenge Red Bull unless something happened. He did say they struggled on the mediums early on and actually to start with on the hards after the pit stop, but they eventually came in and wasn't too bad. Again, like I say, just the only thing I was disappointed at was the fact he didn't challenge for pole. I thought he was on for that, but uh, a little way off 
in the end. What else have I got? Really good close racing and that battle with Sergio Perez at the start. Always good to see those two side by side. So that was fun. Really enjoyed that. More of that, please. Um, and as I say, struggled on the mediums and the hards a little bit, but it all came good. And I think Fred Vasseur said they really paid the price for being stuck in traffic at times as well. So yeah, the car looked good. He said the car felt good. The pace was clearly there. I think Ferrari are, again, we'll, we'll go for a sample size of two races, but I think Ferrari are quite clearly the second best team, aren't they, um, at the moment? And I, again, I don't think that podium was ever really going to go away unless something went wrong, which, you know, it's Ferrari, it can do. But I think Leclerc drove very well, especially given all the attention was on the other side of the garage. I mean, maybe that helped him, Stuart. Maybe no one's even thinking about it. So I thought, I'll just get on with it then. Leave me to it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I thought he did it. He did a great job. Um, I think it's, I mean, he said he drove a pretty lonely race, but he said he felt very happy with the way that Ferrari is performing right now. And he's clearly doing better this year. They're in a better place than they were last year. Obviously, they're hoping to become even better and move forward. But um, as things stand performance-wise with nothing going wrong, I feel like they are in a little bit of a no man's land. Um, sort of unable to catch Red Bull, but not too worried about People, people behind for the for the moment, which is kind of what you said, but I think that's kind of where they're going to be for for the next few races. I say this: we can go to Australia, which is a different track all over again, and then things could be <laughs> different. I mean, they're racing in the daytime for the first time; we haven't yeah. had that yet, so who knows? Um, it's a bit. Uh, they've clearly got some pace in that car. It's a shame they just can't make it work in in a sort of uh, over the race. Like I reckon he could be snatching a few poles again, like he did last year. But it, you know, the way Perez has managed to get past him or well get past the ferraris both races this year is well concerning for for the competitiveness so we're go i'm gonna hope that they manage to kind of move a bit closer and start to challenge a bit more more for wins now but in terms of where they are right now i don't think they could have asked for much more than that ferrari is is clearly in a strong place um interesting to see how far he can can take it and again where where science can go from here yeah, but it's a really interesting dynamic of that team anyway this season and not just with the drivers, but you know, Fred Vasseur's first car really, isn't it? This one and maybe maybe that maybe his inputs made a difference, but they uh, on Fred Vasseur in the, in the post-race quotes, he does actually touch on the fact that they appear to have solved some of the tie deck issues they had. So they seem to be getting their act together on a, on a well, we're going to say Sunday because that's where we're going now. Um, if you're in Europe and the UK, I think that was the last Saturday race of the season. Obviously, uh, some places and, and some states in America are going to have a Saturday race when we get to Vegas, but we are back to Sundays now. Thank God. Uh, <laughs> it, sh it really shouldn't make that much of a difference, but it really does. <laughs> so, yeah, so, you know, we'll say Sundays, but I think they seem to be getting their Sundays together. Saturdays, they look good. I think Leclerc overall, good weekend. Good to see Ferrari. Obviously, as a Ferrari fan, um, getting it right for a change. And I look forward to discussing their shocking strategy uh, in the next few weeks. Weeks. Uh, Red Raven, thank you very much, mate. He says, unless you have uh, guys have spoken about it, uh, seems like Perez has got his act together and is much more solid number two with the changed car concept. Uh, he's starting to secure his seat. Yeah, we did, we did touch on it briefly. I said that I think that um, if... How did I word it? I said something along the lines of if he keeps doing what he's doing and he's second to Verstappen and on the podium and, you know, better in qualifying, then he's 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 sort of got to show them that he's better than your Ricardos and your Sonodas who might take that seat. Obviously better than a science as well who might take that seat. So, uh, yeah, I think Perez has, has started well. But don't forget, very quickly before we move on, uh, Sergio Perez won two of the first four races last year. So, you know, it's, all, it's not how you start. Um, it's how you finish. I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, <laughs> let, let's talk about McLaren then. Uh, they're the third team on my list today. What did I put down? So I want to talk about Piastri first because, well, I've worded it. How can I word this? We don't always have to start on a negative. Um, I know what people want to get to, but I'm going to start on Piastri because I think he deserves a lot of credit for what was a really, really strong weekend. Um, he pipped Landon Norris in qualifying and went on to pick up some big points with P4. He was three and a half seconds-ish clear of Fernando Alonso, uh, 13 seconds off a podium, but still a really solid P4. Uh, and that's despite the fact McLaren had what appeared to be a, a DRS disadvantage. He did spend a lot of time behind Lewis Hamilton uh, and made quite a few mistakes whilst trying to get past, overtaking, locking up and going off track at turn one as one mm. example. Um, but it was 
highly unlikely he'd be challenging for a podium anyway. So I think that's probably the best he could get was P4. And he absolutely delivered that. So, you know, you, you could throw your arguments around about it was helped by, by Norris and Hamilton staying out and on the, on the sort of alternate compromise strategy. But he got the call under the safety car because he was first car on track and he was first car on track because he qualified better and didn't balls up his start. So you've got to give him the credit exactly. for that. Um, and I'm also going to make the point, and Stuart will like this because he'll know where I've got this from. Um, the average gap between Norris and Piastri in qualifying is just 0.013 in Norris's favour. There you go. Wow. Wow. Spread He's starting strong, is that boy? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it was a very impressive weekend. And I... You know, we speak about points come on the on on the race day, whichever day that might be. <laughs> um, but you know, getting a good position, getting that better position in qualifying, and getting starting the race um, ahead will get you a best choice in strategy. And if you need to come into the pits, if you need to make that call, you, you'll be the first. But in most teams, you'll be the person who get to make that call. And if um, there's a safety car rush to the pit lane. Um, you won't be the one who will have to queue behind your teammate. You'll be the one in first place and the teammate will have to decide if they want to queue or, or try something different. So yeah, he made it. He put in the work. He made it work. Um, the battle between him and Hamilton was really interesting, I thought, because he was clearly faster um, for most of the time they were together on chat, but he just just couldn't get past. And that DRS deficit was, 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 was certainly playing a part. Hamilton was really able to make it work coming down the, the pit straight. And it was a nice, nice little battle, I thought. Obviously, some mistakes, but it's the kind of track where you're, um, where everyone has sort of made mistakes when they're in battle. Even people like Hamilton and Verstappen, as we've seen in years gone by. So, yeah, I'm impressed by him, and I, I think this is the year where he's going to be trying to show he's at least equal with Norris in this car, and not let Norris become the de facto sort of team lead. I think he's going to try and prove himself that he's there to do whatever the car is capable of you on yeah he wowed me last year um with his rookie season and i, I feel like he's going to do the same this year but you make an interesting point because obviously the pressure's gonna be a bit higher this year isn't it because he can't use the excuse well you know he's a rookie you know he's a rookie so give him some time he's, he's had a season he's now got to take the next step and and you know second season syndrome is something people talk about sometimes in f1 and, and other sports as well so i hope that's not a real thing or whether it's just coincidence for some people but um i think he's had a very strong start and it was i think it was his qualifying performance actually on saturday that surprised me the most um to pip norris like that so i've got nothing <laughs> much more to add on fiasco otherwise other yeah. than just it was an impressive performance and you're right on the how i think it's a, it's a very draggy car anyway in a straight line isn't it but um it, there's a drs disadvantage as well they were talking about so that's obviously gonna be a factor in there but um he got passed in the end uh, and i think i think i think he was lining up the pass just as hamilton pulled in the pits it looked like he was gonna get it done then hamilton pitted and it was like oh that's another overtake taken away then but uh <laughs> no no well done to oscar piastri and uh, aussie p as we called him in testing that was supposed to stay in testing but here we are um uh, yeah no i i impressed with him over the whole weekend um should we talk about schrodinger's jump start um let's 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 yes it's still very confusing and this seems to be incredibly controversial to a lot of people <laughs> well in life generally speaking i am a believer that if it looks like a duck swims like a duck and quacks like a duck then it probably is a duck um, however, that's not something that can always be applied to Formula One because from the comfort of my sofa, Lando Norris jumped the start. Um, he moved before the lights went out, stopped, and then got going again once the lights eventually did disappear. Um, but the stewards investigated the incident and decided he did not. And their decision states, and we'll read the, the decision. Um, it's not too long, so don't worry. But the stewards reviewed positioning marsh marshalling system data and determined that the video appeared to show that car four, that's Norris, uh, moved before the start signal was given. However, the FIA approved and supplied transponder fitted on the car did not indicate a jump start. Article 48.1A of the Formula One Sports Regulations states clearly that the judgment of whether or not there was a jump start is to be made in accordance with the transponder, which did not show a jump start in the circumstances. We took no further action. So essentially, uh, if the transponder says it didn't move, uh, then he didn't move, um, even though he clearly 
moved and, and anthony davis said i think anthony davis just said computer said no uh in his analysis <laughs> at the end of it's so like yeah fair enough um but there are a few other points i want to make so when you go down a line in the regulations to so 48 1 b and 48 1 c um they mm -hmm. state that penalties will be imposed on any driver just to have b positioned his car on a starting grid in such a way that the transponder is unable to detect the movement at which the car first moved from its grid position after the start signal was given that's i think why Alonso got the penalty last year uh, and then C any part of the contact patch of, of its front tires outside of the lines front and sides at the time of the start signal so if your tires aren't touching the line or in contact with the line then you've jumped the start but I'm not really sure why we have articles B and C if article A unless I'm reading it wrong Stuart appears to supersede that because if the transponder still says he didn't move that he's not going to get a penalty. And this is what Anthony Davidson was saying, that even if McLaren, if they'd given a penalty and McLaren had protested it, then they'd have had to wipe the penalty because the regulation states the transponder makes the decision, not the naked eye, which seems like, seems confusing, but also seems like such an FIA way to do things. I think, well, okay. Uh, there's a couple of things. I'll address the sort of the last thing in terms of why do they have B and C when A supersedes it. I think B and C are slightly different. B, yeah. I mean, B, B suggests there is a position you can put your car in such that the transponder won't even um, pick up on the fact that you, you've jumped the start. Um, and C is just, you haven't jumped the start, but you've started like outside of your, outside of your little grid slot. I, it, it does seem weird there. They, they've written themselves no leeway, even after actually precedent, because I think this is very similar to what happened to um, Vettel and I can't remember where, uh, and Bottas as well. Um, so if you if you look through the series of events that happened the lights are still on he moves forward he's still moving forward when the lights go off he's crossed the front part of his grid slot and then he stops and then he gets going again so you could argue he stopped again and only got started after the lights had gone out so probably no advantage even though he was I don't know maybe a a foot half a foot forward um you know if you want to be like so if you want to play it by that game where it's like well you know no advantage he stopped again it's fine on the other hand if you want to play it the way the fia seemed to play it which is like hard and fast understanding of a jump start he was moving when the lights went out <laughs> um which you could see with your eyes and it just seems weird they've written themselves they've given themselves no leeway to just be able to make a judgment call on what they can see with their eyes um no, unclear as to what the deal is with the transponder whether it was i think anti davison suspected the transponder was faulty or whether there was just it, it just happened to be in a position where it was wasn't being picked up properly um i don't know but it is it is weird that technically if you were feeling um cheaty and you wanted to sort of sabotage the transponder in some way and you just jump the start as or, or if the transponder's just broken and you jump the start and you clearly jump the start, you don't even stop. Um, you can get away with that. That's, that seems to be the, me the measure of what the rules say, which I think is um, strange. And considering the FIA seem to be very, very strict on rules, even when they don't make a difference, like, you know, you either crossed the line or you didn't. You're either over the speed limit or you didn't, that kind of thing. It, it just seems weird um, that they're in a situation where this doesn't... It seems to fall out of sight of it, I think. I, I mean, I'm not that bothered in terms of penalty because I do think he stopped again, and so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but it just seems weird. Well, funnily enough, actually, the fact that he jumped, stopped, and then the lights went out as soon as he stopped, it actually compromised his start, didn't it? Because he had quite a sluggish start. Yeah. Um, so funnily enough, he kind of penalised himself, but um, that's that's not how the regs work, is it? And just back to the, the, the point B and C thing, I think, you know, you... You're absolutely right in your points. I think B, like I say, the position this car in a starting grid in such a way, that one is going to be why I think Ocon got one last year in Bahrain. Um, Saudi Arabia, Alonso got one last year, didn't he? So that's because they were out, outside of the grid box and not in correct positions. So that could have been through the transponder. It's it's just, um, it's odd to me that you have sort of this list of things and then you have ultimately the stewards going, yeah, I mean, we saw him move, but transponder said he didn't. And it's like, is that all we are in life? I went to a, just on a yeah. total random tangent, I went to a 40th birthday party on Saturday and I bought, you've seen them, Stuart, I bought some flashing shoes, 
flashing light shoes. I did. They are incredibly um, cool shoes. And I, I had a I had a kind of mental breakdown when I turned around to my partner, um, and I was like, "When did we co- reach the point in you know evolution and and technology where I'm able to use a sentence? My shoes are charged. Uh, <laughs> it was <laughs> very weird. And that's the FIA kind of thing. Where, you know, your eyes can see he's moving, but because the transponder says he wasn't, he wasn't, but he clearly was. So we can all look at that and say jump start but at the end of the day if the regulations say that it wasn't because that's the way they're worded and the transponder i've not seen anything concrete by the way on as you say whether the transponder was broken or faulty i've seen a lot of speculation some people um some media publications are saying it, it was broken anthony davison speculated but i've not seen anything from the fia that definitively says yes it was no. broken or faulty so i'll kind of We'll put that in there just in case that is the case, but I don't think I can see as that's absolutely what it is because I haven't got the information that says that. So I, I, I it's weird. It's it's just this the FIA, the rules. I, I still maintain. I've said this a million times. They need a long winter break because somebody needs to sit down and just rewrite everything because I, I just feel like I keep adding things to things and it just confuses other things and contradicts another thing and it just causes all sorts of problems. So as say Anthony Davis is saying that if they had got the penalty, they could then have gone, well, Transponder says it didn't. So and then they'd have to write the penalty off anyway. So maybe that's why the stewards took no action. But there is also the, the other thing as well is I'm not sure. I've not seen a definitive angle that says that Norris's tire was not in some sort of contact with the white line on the grid box um the onboard shot that anthony davison uses he's that's after the lights have gone out and he's already moving again so that's after he started moving again so i, I can't use that one um and there's no photo angle from the side and i go back to a few years ago I remember sebastian vessel at monza in qualifying went what we thought was wider parabolica as it was then um and his wheel looked to the naked eye like it was over the white line but then they did a top down shot and because the wheel was over the white line from the top down he didn't get a penalty. I think his lap time deleted. And I don't know if there's like an overhead shot that shows that that tire is just over the white line and just enough to to not set off the transponder if it was working. And and because he's got contact patch of the tire on the white line. <laughs> it's all so confusing, Stuart. I'm yeah, trying. I don't know. <laughs> it, we're, we're running around in circles where we've got TV footage of him moving while the, when the lights go out. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> which is i don't know i feel like that should be point a are you moving before the lights go out yes jump start <laughs> or yeah um also by the way loved <laughs> george russell he's such a snitch <laughs> jump start norris <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> straight to the point george uh, doing that on the run down to turn one you know christ concentrate man <laughs> <laughs> my friend my friend who i watch all, all the races really he, he's got a a bit of a bugbear about George doing that kind of thing. He threw his hands in the air and immediately went, George, he's such a public school boy. <laughs> what a snitch to teach him he is. <laughs> sir, sir, he jumped the start, sir. Uh, what? Uh, I'll do it one day. I keep promising to tell the story of, of who he reminds me of, uh, but I keep bottling it. So um, I'll come to it at some point. I'll do it later. We'll see. Um, is there anything else you want to add on Norris? I'm going to get to take some comments from chat because um, there's some comments in there. Um, a lot seem to agree that, you know, the duck thing. <laughs> Probably a duck. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't want to just keep reading through decisions and uh, umming and ahhing about a regulation that's not 100%. Well, no, it's clear. The regulation is clear. To be fair to the FA, I understand it. I'm not completely stupid. I'm very stupid. I'm not completely stupid. But again, you know, I'm looking at it. It's like, well, he's jumped the start. Nah, computer says he didn't but he did, but he didn't. <laughs> it's so silly. Yeah. I mean, there's not much else you can say, although I will, I, I don't like throwing the whole rule book away and rewriting it from scratch is maybe a bit much to ask, but I feel like the sport doesn't help itself sometimes when it does things that, you know, they're bringing in, bringing in new fans and stuff and they, they have these kind of rules that just seem to make absolutely no sense well to make i mean we're, we're seasoned f1 watcher people and we think it makes no sense but like someone who comes in from the outside who also has eyes um <laughs> just it just just seems baffling to me I, I said something actually similar um uh after the f2 race i think when um um uh for sure got disqualified for 
what seemed like an incredibly complicated technical reason that I would struggle to explain to someone who had no knowledge of like the inner workings of how these cars work. And it just seems by that point, maybe everything's a little bit too complicated. We're definitely not going down this road. Don't worry. But I'm going to ask the question. Did you ever try and describe, explain Abu Dhabi 2021 to people who weren't F1 fans? <laughs> I've, I've had several times Struggle. and it's so annoying because it's it has it's so at its core it's got this incredible like emotional like soap opera tale of sort of I mean you can spin it in in a number of ways but to set it up and explain <laughs> all the rules that exist and and how they were interpreted and and what caused them to go into effect and what a safety car is and what the tie rules are and 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 <laughs> <laughs> and what you do when you're restarting under the set yeah it takes about 10 minutes of setup by which point the payoff they've already wandered off it's so hard to explain why everyone was so um on their feet shouting at their tv for one reason or another at that point um it's, it's a shame really because it is it is, it is such an exciting moment in sport but you can't you, you can't explain it quickly enough to keep people excited you need to sit them down and watch the entire season <laughs> <laughs> build up to that point i genuinely had somebody say to me what's a massey <laughs> like it was something that was on the car I was just, <laughs> no <laughs> you're missing my point anyway uh quickly see what you guys say in the chat then we'll move on uh to the other things i want to talk about um we just i'll stick to the stuff that's relevant then we'll do q a later so we can be a bit more broad um a short q a today probably we'll see how we go and uh, that sense i must have had some serious lag for it not to detect a jump start says cited canvas uh, red raven says that at the very least for once technicality saves the driver's race instead of ruin for a change um you open up the rules to allow interpretation there'll be a huge mess down the line i always agree with that um but i also think that sporting rules in all sports needs to have an area of individual interpretation otherwise <laughs> you have sensors deciding whether a car that is clearly moving is moving or not um mm -hmm. i know the penalty should be given dependent on the outcome but norris probably got off easy because he screwed himself with that jump start says the mac uh two more uh del says hi del says by the rule uh, if your transponder malfunctions you could do whatever you want or do a slow rolling start and jordan says the sensor is faulty and didn't go off again i've not seen anything 100 percent on that and actually nick says why not scrap all the rules instead of writing and rewriting them for a millionth time uh, i agree let's let's <laughs> let's have a battle royale f1 i think that'd be um well, that would be hell, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also absolutely brilliant. So, still to come, uh, we'll discuss the Magnuson Express, uh, how the lack of strategy impacted the race. I'll run through my notes for the rest of the pack as well in the rundown, and we'll take some of your comments. But, Hass, um, I don't know where to start here. Uh <laughs> I'm a little bit lost. Uh, first of all, great stuff from Nico Hulkenberg to get a point. Also, thank you very much for Nico Hulkenberg getting a point because it means that I get another point on my bold predictions this week because I said Hulkenberg for a point. So there you go. Thank you very much. Uh, but we need to talk about K-Mag, I think, is, is where we're going here and his backing up of the pack to help uh, Nico snatch that final point. Uh, so right from the off, and I think a lot of people will agree, or I hope a lot of people will, I have no issue whatsoever with magnuson driving slowly to hold up the cars behind to allow his teammates to build a gap so they can have a chance at a point because f1 it is a sport of individuals because we've got the driver's championship but we also have a constructor championship and it's a team sport as well so working together to maximize your team result is absolutely brilliant i applaud Haas for that it's fantastic work and it's important that we have that element in the sport so it's why i'm not against team orders as long as it's not stopping on the line and letting your teammate go through to win. But I think you can use team orders to to get the best result for your teams. I'm 100% behind them for that. Especially, again, going back to what we said earlier about how difficult it could be for teams like Haas and Sauber and RB to pick up points this year. They might have to think outside the box and do these things. Um, and that point, actually, at the end of the season, with it being so tight, could be crucial in the championship. That could be worth millions if they pip, let's say, Williams yeah. to eighth place, for example. So it could be an absolutely brilliant move. The issue I have... And I think this is the issue that a lot of people have is that there was an overtake on Yuki Sonoda that was done off the track and therefore illegal. In fact, so illegal, he got a second, he got a 10 second penalty for it, didn't he? So it was clearly an illegal move. It is important to say that he hadn't been asked to slow down before that. So he's not overtaken Sonoda with the aim of slowing Sonoda down. He's overtaken Sonoda off track 
kept the position. And then I think four laps later, around lap 20, the team then asked him to stick to a lap time and then wanted him to slow down. So it's not it's not that he's flown past an odor at full speed to get ahead so he can back him up. It's just something that's then has to have seen an opportunity um, and taken advantage of that. So it's that's the issue for me is the fact it was quite clearly uh, an illegal overtake and I don't think, which we'll get into in a minute, I'm sure, I don't think the change to the penalty has worked. I'm not quite sure why 10 seconds really makes a lot of difference to five seconds. It's five seconds more, obviously, but it doesn't really do, doesn't really fix the problem. Whereas just saying to a driver, I say we'll get into it in a minute, I'll get into it now, apparently, there you go. But why not just say to the driver, you've overtaken illegally, give the position back. If they've not done it within a lap, two laps if you want to be generous it's a guaranteed drive through penalty that way they give the position back and they're heavily penalized for that that's that's my I mean, view i mean i completely agree and that's what i've written down on my notes as well i think i understand the need um there were there was some there was some precedent for like five seconds not being enough because drivers uh, uh the need for increasing the penalty i mean um because drivers were passing off track or passing in a, in a in a sort of illegal manner, and then deciding, you know what, I can make up these five seconds. It's worth it. Um, and so, yeah, with ten seconds, it's a little bit more. It's a little bit trickier to do that. You need to sort of you'd need to sort of weigh up the benefits of uh, uh, passing someone off track and not giving the place back. But again, I, I think if you're in a faster car and you're clearly uh, uh, boxed in behind someone not able to overtake effectively and you, you decide, oh, you know what, I'm going to cut the corner. I know I'm faster than him, I just can't overtake him. But if I cut the corner, I could probably pull out 10 seconds, it's worth it. So it's not, in setting it at 10 seconds, it kind of actually is instructing you to be like, yeah, you could pass them off track if you're fast enough to to make up the, the penalty. So yeah, I think, I don't understand why we still, after all this time, just haven't had a hard and fast give the place back rule. Um, it doesn't matter if someone else has overtaken him as well in the meantime, just you're going to have to drop back multiple places the longer you take to give it back. Um, which, in, which which we, we said the word precedent a lot lately. I can't remember what race it was. I think it was Monda at some point when Alonso did pass someone illegally and about five laps later was told to hand the position back. He'd already gone about eight seconds up the road and there was a car between them, but he did slow down and let both cars through and then start again from scratch. So it's not like we haven't done it before and it's not impossible. And I, I think you're right. Yeah. Make them, make them fix it back or, or, or hammer them with a drive through or something. It seems a really easy thing to, to do. It, it, you know, drive, drive throughs are heavy penalties. That's why they introduced the time penalties. Didn't they? Um, was because they felt the drive through was too heavy for a bit of wheel banging, which flicks a bit of end fence off or something. Um, but, the fact is what we had on Saturday, which again was great team play. I, I have no issue with the actual act of backing the field up. We saw, I mean, I'll go back to 1999 if you want. And my hero, Michael Schumacher, letting Eddie Irvine through in Malaysia and then backing everybody up so he can get away. I have no problem with that. That's just very clever. T it's smart team play. Um, and it's good thinking for the team. And it's, it's good of Magnussen to to do that he didn't have to i mean his race was done wasn't it with 20 seconds worth of time penalties uh, including yeah. that squeeze that's on screen now on, on poor alex Albon, who's just minding his business um we'll get to that when we get to album but um you know it's all right five second penalty 10 second penalty there's somebody a couple in chat discussing that you know well the drivers wanted 10 seconds yes they did but of course they do because they know that they can that that's a harder penalty and looks harder but they can also still use that to their advantage if needs be whether it be to back the field up like we see or as you said Stuart pull out a 10 second gap you give Max Verstappen a 10 second penalty it's probably pointless uh, with the pace in that car so if a driver overtakes another driver off track then it needs to be look just K okay, Mag give the position back mate and then we'll say no more about it they do that, and I'd love them to word it like that. Um, and they do that. He, he gives the position back, and that's the end of it. And then he can continue his fight with, with Yuki Tsunoda or whatever. But if he then refuses to do that, there needs to be something harder than 10 seconds at your pit stop because Magnussen can then back everyone up, allow Hulkenberg to disappear, um, and then take his penalty at his pit stop at the end of the race. And it's not made any difference to his race whatsoever because he was getting the penalties anyway. So I think a drive through is enough of a deterrent for drivers to go, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll let him go because there's just no point. There's no point me because what's the drive of 20 well it's 22 seconds through the pit lane i think last year in 
Saudi Arabia with the stops. So that's a 20-second penalty, basically, isn't it, through the pit lane, plus the slowing yeah. down and speeding up. So it, it, to me, that that's enough for deterrent. But also, I don't want to get back to the days of you know, a driver exhaling in the wrong way next to another driver and getting a drive through because that was too much. Or, or do you want to go back even further to when you just got a 10 second penalty? None of this time penalty drive through is it was a 10 second stop go penalty, wasn't it? But back in there, get the Hovis music ready. We're off again. Yeah, I think it was 2003 before we got drive throughs. Um, I think I remember Montoya got it, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a very sensible often we sort of twist ourselves into knots. I say we, I mean like the FIA twist themselves into knots, like devising ways of managing the race where I'm not going to say the words gentleman's agreement because I think that's not necessarily it, but there is a way of just sorting this out without fuss. In this case, give the position back. But there is there there is like a grace period of which they just, you know, just give the position back, just sort this out. Don't make us penalize you. But if you don't, then we will properly penalize you. Um, I think there's a there's definitely a benefit of having these smaller penalties, you know, starting with the drive through and then a 10 second and a five second penalty thing you can add on in the pit stop after race. I think there's use to that because there are small little infringements that I think don't necessarily need to be hammered. Um, but I think the issue they can have if they're not, you know, meted out to the right things is you're kind of giving the drivers an exchange rate. Um, it, it's sort of like a, just a thing you factor into to decisions you make and is it worth taking a five second penalty in which case i will do it like you could choose to do something illegal because you know you can afford the cost and that and that that does seem to be what the rules kind of suggest if you if you give that as as the as the sort of exchange rate of a penalty so there is some kind of like balancing to be done with that because you don't really want drivers and teams to be saying yeah we can we can do this illegal thing it's fine because we can we can afford it you kind of want them to you, you kind of want them to not do that at all and if they do it it's more likely to be an error which they can hopefully undo if that makes sense yeah i don't know if um if I'm not explaining it properly, um, but Fallen Shall Rise, I think, yeah, Fallen Shall Rise says, somehow Perez goes off foot off track on the corner after he defends from Leclerc for second and we give him a drive-through penalty and he drops back to 19th. That seems crazy. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you overtake off track or you gain the advantage by leaving the track and you're asked to give the position back, so in your in your example, um, Fallen Shall Rise, if Perez were to go past Leclerc, not make the corner and then keep his position, the FIA would then say, give that position back and if Perez then relinquishes that position as we saw in f2 when they were going off track and in f1 as well people just ease off the throttle let that driver back through and then go in on the attack again then there's no penalty but if he goes ahead and refuses to then give that position back then they need to step in and give a drive through that's that's the point but Stuart's right on balance and that works for everything and, and, and oscar said the point that no penalties will ever be perfect and you're absolutely right but there has to be a balance i think there are certain you know <sighs> every single incident every single off track incident um, is different isn't it so it's very difficult to get the balance right but i just think that deterrent when something as simple as just let the car go and then go again why why so why compromise your entire race but then it's worked out quite well for Haas, hasn't it with the with the point and, and nico hulkenberg gets his credit for for pumping the laps in when he needed to as well to to get that point so um i'll reiterate for i'm coming in late I'm, i have no problem with what Haas did I just have a problem with the rule on leaving the track and gaining an advantage. And I suspect there'll be quite a few drivers, probably most of those cooped up behind him. I think Alan Pomain at RB is pretty cross about it all, but um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, you know, how cross he'd be if he was there during the AlphaTauri days when we're at Qatar and Pierre Gasly eased off the throttle on a straight and Max Verstappen went freezing past uh, in a different team but you know let's, <laughs> or suspected <laughs> let's say suspected you know um you know whatever it's uh, that's my view uh it's not going to change i think i don't want to drive like you say i don't want to drive through for every petty little thing Stuart, because that's just gonna be chaos isn't it um and i agree with what um fallen show rise is saying that if a driver just runs wide then if they give the position back, they don't get a penalty on top of that. It is if they refuse to give the position back. And that, because it compromised a lot of people's races. Um, and I, I did see a lot of people, uh, especially John T, uh, <laughs> saying, you know, if the cars are faster, then overtake him. But 
it's a tricky track to overtake on magnuson was also playing it smart he was slow where he knew they couldn't get past and then he was fast enough where he knew they could so he was playing that smart but also i don't know if you've noticed uh, k mag in defense is a very uh, punchy driver so you've always got to calculate that risk haven't you do you just send it on k mag is he just going to send it in and also if he's already got time penalties and he's running wide and cutting the track anyway to keep position is he gonna let you go so i don't think it's not as simple as in a place like Jeddah, just drive up to the back of him overtake him because magnus was being strategic and we saw that by the fact that as soon as hulkenberg came out in front of him he you know excuse the language pissed off up the road <laughs> he clearly had the yeah. pace to k mag in the end so he was he was being clever with it um which by the way actually kind of to another point on has stewart that's good to see because that means there is race pace in that Haas. I know he was looking after his tyres during that time, but clearly he was able to hold them up, be quick where he needed to be, and then accelerate away once Hulkenberg rejoined in front of him. So it's sort of almost night and day to last season for Haas. So they can be competitive, I guess is my point. Yeah, I mean, all round, pretty impressive. And I know Hulkenberg wouldn't have got that 10 without sort of the, the sort of teamsmanship, but... That Haas is in a lot better place than they thought they were going to be um, coming out of testing, coming into the start of this year. They they made a lot of calls about them being kind of the worst on track and not expecting too much from the first half of the year, but actually um, pretty pacey and they're able to do some stuff. They still have got their qualifying pace, their, their Saturday or whatever, their, their qualifying day. You know, they can deliver some stuff and not necessarily like completely fall back through the order like like they used to. So that's good to see and i can i can totally understand if you're out of main if you're if you're an rb being frustrated about what happened but i will also say they let ocon get ahead of them yeah. and i feel like yeah. if ocon wasn't the first driver in the queue behind magnuson it might have been a bit easier for them to get past but they did allow ocon to to, to overtake and kind of hold up the rest of that queue i think and that that car's not great in a straight line and, and we, we saw the, the cars that were sort of struggling with DRS or in straight line speed were um, not able to make the most of that big long uh, pit straight. So they they had a they did have a hand in, in a bit of their own demise, I will say. But of course Saloda wouldn't have been um vulnerable to Ocon if Magnuson hadn't passed him on track. So you know, there's a whole <laughs> there's a whole <laughs> lot going on there. But yeah, no, I think I, I, I think we understand where we where we stand with all this. Yeah. And apologies to anybody in chat if you didn't quite catch kind of the point I was making there. I, I tend to waffle if you knew. <laughs> As if a lot people that are here often will go, "Yeah, he never shuts up," um, and then I tend to tie myself in knots and then I confuse the situation. So again, you know, well, I'm not going to go over it again, but I've said what I said. So um, just very quickly because it was going to lead in quite nicely to the next point. But just on Hulkenberg, good fight early on with Behrman, and I think did a pretty good job to keep him at bay for as long as he did, given the pace of that Ferrari. So, uh, but a point for Hulkenberg, good stuff. Um, for him but i was gonna say Stuart, as a an idea on the the has thing really for how those cars could have got past one way they could have got past was with an undercut for example um however strategy on saturday was well it wasn't was it it, it, it just there was no strategy and so because that safety car came out because of lance stroll's crash we ended up with pretty much, I think, all but... In fact, I've got my list here. It's somewhere here. Let's have a look. So everyone except for Norris, Hamilton, Hulkenberg, and Joe pitted on lap seven of a 50-lap race to put on a set of hard tyres and go to the end. So there wasn't even the option for your Sonodas or your Ocons or your Albans or whoever to stick on a set of fresh tyres and try and undercut Kevin Magnussen or anything or try and undercut Hulkenberg because there was no strategy on Saturday. And it's it's one of the things that frustrates me about Pirelli when it comes to Saudi Arabia. Last year, es uh, not Espen Ocon, Oscar Piastri put on a set of hards at the end of lap one and went all the way to the end. And Yuki Tsunoda said pre-weekend in his notes, there will be virtually no tyre degradation. Why did Pirelli, and this isn't just for the benefit of hindsight, I'm talking about, you know, we've had a year since Saudi Arabia last year, why did Pirelli not go a step softer on the tyres if we've got tyres that can basically do the whole race? Uh, apparently, the mediums, people say, would have probably hung on for as long as well if, if people started on the hards and then gone medium on lap seven and run them to the end. It, it's 
it's incredible as well when you think of the difference between Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. I know very new yeah. circuit, but you look at how high degradation was in Bahrain and then you come to Saudi and you could probably have, if, if mandatory pit stops weren't a thing, somebody could have probably started on the hards and gone right to the end without a pit stop. It's it's crazy. So I feel like next year, Pirelli need to go more aggressive in their, in their compound selection because clearly the track would be fine to go a step softer. Yeah, I tend to agree. And uh, Joe, of course, did go 41 laps on the mediums and I think kind of only stopped because he needed to and you got to pick your moment to get the best out of a, a set of soft tyres. Um, while I do, I, w- I would say, you know, not you don't have to kind of match all the compounds so every race is kind of similar in terms of strategy and you're kind of always forcing a two-stop or something and, and maybe, you know, maybe it is nice to have some races where strategy, tyre strategy isn't the main um, you, you know, way of going about the race, and we can focus on just racing each other on track. Wouldn't that be nice? But it did kind of take the wind out of any sort of options for this race. Um, as you say, you sort of just forced everyone, to, almost everyone, to go the whole distance on the hard tires. And yeah, maybe, maybe there would have been like a bit more uh, fighting and intrigue and stuff if we hadn't had that early. You see, you know, I mean, we, we kind of expect at least one safety car on this track. It's a, it's a tricky track. It's very fast. The, the barriers are very close. Uh, uh, someone, I, either someone's going to have an accident or, you know, there's going to be a breakdown. It's going to be in a place that's too dangerous to, uh, to remove the car without neutering the race. You know, we, we kind of expect a, a safety car um possibly even two as i think the people who didn't stop were kind of their only hope was for having another stoppage at some point it just sort of happened at the point where it forced everyone's hand and i think yeah if we'd gone a bit softer and you know the the difference between the compounds the what the c1 to the two to the three to the four to the five aren't all like identical like going up a or down a, a block doesn't necessarily uh, equate to the same kind of thing. And I think the difference between the C1 and the C2 is actually pretty negligible from what I understand from Pirelli. The C5, I'm I'm unsure at the time. But again, they could have kept the C2 and the C3 and dropped down to the C5 or done something, I don't know, done done something interesting. It's tricky, isn't it? Um, Or they need to just rewrite their compounds again. Um, yeah, it, 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 it's, a, it's a bit of a shame that nothing came from that. If we'd had a second safety car stop, maybe we would have had something a bit more interesting in the second half of the race. It's one of those, isn't it, where it's all right me sitting here saying, you know, why not go a step softer? But I suppose we also have to um, consider that obviously Pirelli have more information than us. They may have something that says that if we go a step softer, those tyres will fail, which has got to be a concern for them. Um, but I'd be surprised if going a step softer, it's not like I'm saying go from the hardest compounds to the softest. We're in the middle of the range. I'd be surprised if bearing in mind that the, if we were to go a step softer, the medium from this weekend, which probably could have done the whole race would be the hard. So you'd still have a tire that could do almost the whole race. Like you say with, was it uh, Joe going quite a long way in the, where is it? I've got the thing up here. Uh, Yeah. Joe doing 41 laps. laps. So, you'd still have that same compound. It would just be the next till be softer. Um, and then your soft would actually be probably just a qualifying tire or a last lap, fastest lap attempt tire. Um, and then your middle tire would be a bit softer. So there'd be a bit more variation in strategy because that, that was what sort of detracted from the race a little bit. Because when you have a, a dominant team running away with it, one of the things you look for, or I look for is strategy. And if, pretty much everybody's pitted on lap seven and anyone who stayed out is at a massive disadvantage and probably isn't going to get anything without a red flag or another safety car or anything big without a red flag or a safety car. It just, it takes me away from that a little bit because you're you're, you're essentially just sitting waiting for the checkered flag Um, on the strategy side of things. I mean, so I, I don't, I like having that little bit of trying an undercut, trying an overcut, is someone going to go to a two stop? Is it, 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 it's something that I you know enjoy in Bahrain, and I hope in Australia we get something with that as well. But it just it's maybe just quite unique in some ways to this track. I know other tracks are very good for for tire wear, but 
maybe if they build this new thing um <laughs> that they're building well, who, um who, who knows what be like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah very much unsponsored people us yes what the um the soft the soft tire this weekend was in the, 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 i think the thing about it that's a little bit interesting is it it wasn't it didn't have a lot of length in it uh and we saw that i think it was like norris and hamilton when they did finally switch onto the soft at the end they were on scrub tires but they they were catching up to Behrman at first, but actually they did kind of drop off um, a few laps before the end of the race because it, it seemed like they were going to catch him and at least get up right behind him to challenge. But the, the, they weren't able to keep the hot pace going on that soft tyre for more than 10 laps, I want to say, it, it, it seemed like. So dropping down again to the C5 again, you like you said, it'd be a bit of a qualifying tyre, but I think that would squeeze up the strategy a little bit i think and we saw this in testing as well when we were trying to keep track of all the compounds the the gap between the c3 and the c4 was probably the most significant gap between compounds so i don't know if they uh yeah it, it's tricky they wouldn't have anything from the c3 and harder it looks like you know just off from the data that they would have been able to stretch it a long enough stint to make it um a one stop either way so uh, it yeah it, it i think we're just going to sometimes get races like this where you can't force a lot of strategy and and be in a situation where one safety car can just kind of throw all that out the window yeah and i also <laughs> it's a like i don't know what i want i want something in the middle i also don't want to go back to the days of 2012 when tires were falling apart all the time because that all just felt very um not choreographed that's the wrong phrase a bit gimmicky forced it, it wasn't like natural i like you know tires i want them to degrade and i want teams to have to i, th I think martin brunner makes point sort of one of those races where it's like marginal one two stop or marginal two three stop i don't want it to just fall apart and four five six stops in a race but at the same time sticking a tire on for a full race seems a bit bonkers but also actually to be fair to pirelli pretty impressive actually looking at the forces around that track that they've got i mean the surface is fantastic but um that they're able to to build a tire that can go 50 laps at that speed and through all of that <laughs> it impresses me yeah. uh, so i'll give them credit where it's due we'll talk about mercedes very quickly as well i've got a few notes on um we've talked a little bit about lewis hamilton and the oscar piastri battle uh, and then you've mentioned that with the norris thing um quite funny actually uh lewis hamilton spent the first chunk of the race trying to keep oscar piastri behind and then the second chunk of the race trying to get past the other mclaren <laughs> <He's> <laughs> yeah sick of mclarens <laughs> to be fair to him but um just a quick one of george russell uh took p6 decent race considering the lack of pace in that mercedes at some parts of the track he spent much of the race um kind of within striking distance of Fernando Alonso, but just couldn't get close enough to get by. He said post-race, the car was quick down the straights, but the lack of pace through the high-speed corners was what made it tough to kind of keep that pressure on consistently. And that was something we actually saw with our own eyes. We used our eyes, unlike race control, Stuart. You could actually see <laughs> at times um, when Hamilton was following Norris that they'd be sort of nose to tail through turn one. And then through all the high speeds, you could actually visibly see the McLaren yeah. just pulling out that gap to Mercedes. So... Clearly, uh, I think he put 1.1 seconds at one stage, lap 39, I think it was, um, through the high speed section, despite being nose to tail going into turn one. Um, and even Hamilton said on the radio, that's impressive through the high speed with him referring to Norris. And Toto Wolff did actually say after the race uh, that Mercedes has a fundamental problem with the W15 in high speed corners, deriving from simulations not correlating to the racetrack. And without being too harsh, going back to what I was saying at the start about Red Bull dominating and the other teams needing to catch up, this feels like about the third season that Mercedes are still having correlation issues. So I'm not going to blame Red Bull for dominating when we've got teams with the experience of Mercedes and you know Ferrari as well still having the same issues in mercedes case they were having a year ago two years ago despite changing concepts although i suppose give them some slack it's a change of concept they're still learning i suppose so we can let that go it's not the same car as the last two years is it they've gone completely another way so um, i'll give them some slack there but it's the high speed thing will be a concern especially with the likes of suzuka coming up um obviously i think melbourne now they've reprofiled that um that's a very high it was always quite high speed wasn't it, it was really high speed now um i think china as well 
there's a few high speed corners in there. So they get through the first couple of corners through turn I think it's three or four, and then you've got that the S's before you're coming back towards the back straight. So yeah, it's it's that might be a concern for them going forward. But um I've not got a lot of Mercedes race because I feel like that battle between Mercedes and McLaren, and maybe that'll be how these streams go, will be quite a focal point for the first part of this season. That could ebb and flow quite nicely. And and I'm just a little bit concerned for them uh, through the high speed. But they were quick on the straight. So, I mean, that's something. Thank God we go back to ho old Hockenheim this year, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not going to help them in Australia, though, is it? No. It's, uh, it's an interesting... They, I mean, I think they sort of planted themselves as kind of the fifth, the fifth team here, which is not where they wanted to be i i think um mclaren alonso ferrari and, and red bull kind of had the measure of them and this this high speed thing was really unsettling hamilton he was completely complaining about every single day about how the car just did not feel underneath him when he went to high speed and he he did like you like you said he did mention this is the third year in a row it's the same problems and he doesn't understand why they're still struggling with it and it's fascinating to see this team that seems so bulletproof for eight years straight that seemed to have such a slick, impressive operation. They could get on top of anything. They could um, manage rule changes. They could they could roll with the punches and now just don't seem to understand the cars they've built. Um, it, it's interesting how these things can just change all of a sudden. Um, not expecting them to sort of get on top of the cars ahead of them for the next few races. And I think they're just going to have to cope with what comes with them. But considering... When we came out of Bahrain, we were we were saying about McLaren how it's a sort of slow and lower middle speed corners they were struggling with, and that, the high speed stuff was where they were strong. Um, it's going to be on McLaren now to pull away from Mercedes as much as they can over the next few races, where we got a lot of high speed corners, and Mercedes are going to be uh, floundering a little bit more. Even though we'll have races like China that have big long straights that Mercedes are going to hope to keep up with, but it's going to be a worrying few races for them, I think. I, I think we're going to see some sort of um, unhappy faces in the media pen. And perhaps without getting too into it, we're getting a little insight into why Lewis Hamilton is taking a chance at Ferrari next year. Yeah. I've given you three years, guys, and, and we're still having the same issues. Oh, that's, I, do you know what? I say it every time. I can't wait for his book when he retires. <laughs> i'll go straight to the chapter about 2007 that's for sure uh that's gonna be uh great anything else you want to add on, on mercedes um ferrari no stewart i call you ferrari <laughs> why did i call wow. you ferrari <laughs> your strategy's crap uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh no i think that's it i think we i think i think we covered them uh they're disappointing and they need to sort out their high speed Awesome. I think that's very fair. Uh, we'll come to you for some comments and some questions in a minute. I'm just going to do a quick run through of the remaining teams like I did last week. I didn't put any music in though, so um, I apologise. Boo, I know. Uh, so we'll start with Aston Martin. Fernando Alonso was very happy with P5 on Saturday and described the results as probably the maximum that uh, the team could have achieved. Could he have ended up P4? Question mark if he'd been able to keep I think it was Piastri at bay early on. Maybe. We'll never know. Uh, and when you consider how far the likes off the likes of Mercedes and McLaren Aston look to be in Bahrain, I actually think P5 is a really good result. Lance Stroll, as he did in practice, hit the inside wall at turn 22, I think it was. And that sent him into the wall and out of the race on lap six. Uh, Stroll saying he had to be pushing uh, really hard for the opening laps to try and build a gap uh, and then just hit the wall. He was okay, but um, yeah, a bit of a, a miserable day for, for Lance Stroll and... You know. Can you get it back? <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, at Williams, Alex Albon took a decent 11th place. Um, I think all things considered, as already covered, he, he was whacked by Magnussen and that gave him some front wing end plate damage. That's a mouthful, uh, which did have an impact on pace. But Albon said in his post-race quotes, they just didn't have the speed uh, to make their way through the pack. He did have a good start though and was briefly ahead of Behrman, uh, but got caught in traffic at turn one and that meant he also lost a place to K-Mag, which as we now know, had quite a big impact uh, on his and others' races. Uh, he made some cracking overtakes though, despite the damage. Uh, I think a good race from Albon. Um, all things considered. Uh, Logan, although I don't think he was caught too badly in that pack because he did actually end up P11 So uh, and a fair whack up the road. So he was impacted, but probably not as bad as, say, Esteban Ocon and Yuki Sonoda. Uh, Logan Sargent echoed much of what Albon said, but did say uh, that he started to explore the car's potential late on. 
shrugs. Uh, but it was ultimately too late to change much in terms of his P15 position, which eventually became P14 once Sonoda's penalty was applied. Uh, he thinks the team could unlock more pace in Australia. And Dave Robson said that Sargent suffered higher tyre degradation than Albon in the final stint, uh, but overall pace was strong. Curious as to why he waited until late in the race to... Uh, try and explore the limits of the car, but there you go. Uh, Alpine, perhaps a reflection on how bad things have been so far uh, in 2024 for them, but I actually think P13 for Ocon is a solid result. Ah, uh, oh, grimaces. Uh, he was in the pack behind Magnussen and eventually became the head of that train once K-Mag began to pull away. Um, Stuart touched on that as well. So Ocon did say post-race uh, that, that was pretty much the maximum they could have got in terms of finishing position. And ultimately, they just weren't quick enough to challenge four points. No great surprise there. Uh, although I think he would have been in contention without Kevin Roadblock Magnussen. Um, uh, that's a stretch, Sean, in your notes there. Uh, he may have needed a little bit of luck because that car, as we know, is not quick, but, you know, you never know. I retract my statement. No, it wouldn't have been in contention. Uh, let's look at the timing <laughs> screens again. There's no way. Uh, Pierre Gasly, bless him, didn't get very far. Suspected gearbox issue, issue on the uh formation lap took the start but told to retire the car at the end of the first lap and it was later confirmed that he lost sixth gear and then lost synchronization of all the other gears so all in all um not great for him and it looks like it's going to be quite a long first few races for alpine uh, bruno famine the team principal by the way saying even if we have upgrades coming we need to understand our lack of performance not great shape alpine i've also just realized that i need to put fewer pictures in uh for the rundown or on for on the screen for a bit less time because i'm still at williams on the pictures but never mind uh rb uh, yuki snow ended up p14 but post race got a five second time penalty for an unsafe release and that dropped into 15th i believe that was the one pre-race with uh norris uh, we've already gone over all the magnets and stuff so i'm not going to do it again but that compromised his race yuki uh, described it as a difficult grand prix and admitted to making some mistakes including as stewart said letting cars behind him go past when trying to overtake the car ahead obviously Ocon getting through uh, he also points to a lack of overall pace and grip during the race he was the quicker of the two drivers of the weekend though and qualified a very good has to be said uh, p9 on friday i do think a point was on the table for him had it not been for k-mag's shenanigans i love that word uh, but we'll never know for sure daniel ricardo's weekend was eh. His race wasn't helped by a slow safety car pit stop around 40 seconds I timed because I couldn't find the official timing for some reason. So I had to use my uh, stopwatch. But 40 seconds, uh, the team saying in their press release that was caused by problems with the tyres. Um, I don't mm. think it took him totally out of contention there because he was still able to get back in the pack uh, behind K-Mag. But of course, losing track position on the street track is never a good thing. He was P14, by the way, before he pitted and came out P18. He also had a spin late on where he took too much curb at turn one and lost the car. Uh, he recovered and went on to finish in P16. And last up, it's Sauber. Valtteri Bottas ended up P17 with what he called a tough race and tough weekend overall. That's a quote. Uh, in this post-race quotes, he explained that the aggressive soft to hard one-stopper wasn't working for them as they couldn't get the hards working and so switched back to the softs a little bit later on. Uh, and Zhou Guan Yu just had a nightmare weekend really overall a uh, big crash in practice which ultimately prevented him getting a lap in during qualifying he wasn't far off though um the team did get him out on track so well done to them for getting the car on the track he just didn't get around quickly enough to start his flying lap although probably would have ended up 20th anyway with just one flying lap that meant he was late at the start he was last at the start sorry so it was always gonna be tough to make his way through the field from there on a street track uh stayed out when a safety car was deployed and so was running as high as p10 at one stage but as already covered the Staying out strategy didn't work for most of those who tried it, apart from Nico Hulkenberg. And that was made even worse by another cross-threaded wheel nut at his pit stop, like Bottas had in Bahrain. And so that was it really for his race. And he came home P18 and last 6.4 seconds behind his teammate, who of course pitted an extra time as well. So uh, not great for Joe Guan Yu. Fastest lap was Charles Leclerc and Ollie Behrman. <gasps> Shock horror, one driver of the day. I think Oli Behrman won driver of the day before the race even started, to be fair. But uh, those were my rundown notes, Stuart. Would you like to add anything to that while I have a very quick drink before I choke? <laughs> very impressive. I like that. I think um, I think as the season goes on, we, we, we're, we're going to be starting to ask some questions about Daniel Ricciardo. I mean, we are asking questions already, I think, but he's considering this is the season that he's kind of looking to butter up Red Bull to get back in there alongside Verstappen. So far, it's not got off to a great um, start. And despite the shenanigans we spoke about between him and um, Sonoda last season, he's he's sort of been a bit outclassed so far, which is interesting. Um, 
I will also add, yeah, it's two two races in a row that um, Salba, Kick Salba, Stake F1 have um, threaded up a wheel nut and left someone in the pits for just far too long and kind of wrecked whatever hopes they might have had. Uh, yeah, not great. I hope that's um, not something that's going to keep plaguing them as well because that was a that was a real shame. Was different... Not that I was expecting um, Joe to you know get some points, but yeah. No, was it a different wheel this time though? At least. Oh, that's a good question. I think it, I think it was right <laughs> front for him. Okay, so once they get through all four, then they'll be fine. Yeah. So yeah, but they're making it work. <laughs> uh, yeah. Just on the Ricardo thing. I mean, yeah, you know, John said in chat, you know, the pit stop, forty seconds. That's impacted his race, but was he threatening for bum you know he was he was pretty comfortably beaten by um in fact i'm gonna try and find it i'm just sorry i'm in an hour while i try and open two things at once and talk so i'm just going to uh just go straight to the page i want to find a qualifying uh thingy my bobby uh qualifying there we go so yeah uh Sonoda was ninth uh 128 547 ricardo 129 uh zero so half a second slower obviously in the same session though we'll do the same session to be fair still half a second in it so i don't i don't think ricardo was quick this weekend um and i think sonoda very much had him in his pocket but yeah i'm just not i just i know i feel like i'm in the minority when i say it and i often get a bit of grief for it but i just i just don't see why people think the solution to red bull's problems if perez struggles is daniel ricardo or yuki sonoda i just don't see i don't i don't see that i if Perez struggles, and I don't want to say that too much because he had a good start to the season, but if he does start to struggle, I think if I'm Red Bull, I'm I'm looking at a Carlos Sainz before I'm looking at Ricardo or Sonoda. Again, based off a sample size of two races, I know, or multiple years in F1, uh, whichever. But yeah, I'm just I'm just not looking at those two as the solution to any problem they might have. So um, nothing against him. You know, Danny Rick's a nice guy. He's he's popular. Um, you know, he's probably great for the marketing team. I can understand that, but from a racing point of view. Uh, well, no, I don't really know. What I expected did I expect him to come in this season and batter Sonoda? Not really, because um, I don't think Sonoda's as bad as, as people giving grief for. But no, uh, it's it's tricky. We'll we'll see how it pans out over the course of the season. But um, I I am not convinced that those two are the answer to whatever Red Bull's problems may be. Um, Q and A. Then, if you've got any questions, throw them in chat. Go for it. Uh, and then we'll answer a few. We're not going too long tonight, so it's 15, 20 minutes maximum, and then we'll be we're wrapping up. Um, don't forget to leave a like as well. 117 likes, uh, nearly 300 still here. So any more likes will be massively appreciated. Don't forget to subscribe if you're new as well. Uh, we're back to normal race weekends <laughs> as of Australia onwards. So I think these streams will make more sense to anyone who's not understanding why I'm doing it once we get to. The next race weekend because then you have your preview on the thursday i will then enjoy f1 friday saturday sunday as a fan which is what i want to do this season and then the monday the day after the race we'll have the debrief so i think it'll it'll flow a bit better and make more sense it's this start to the season with it being race on a saturday stream on a monday it does feel a bit stop start and a bit disconnected but hopefully as of australia onwards it'll feel a little bit more like it makes sense and if it doesn't and it all fails miserably then i'll do something else it's fine i'll try something else on streams and videos and that it's not a problem but uh if you don't try, you don't know. Uh, simple as that. True, true, true. <laughs> uh, do you think Hamilton will be closer to Russell in Melbourne? Uh, says Random. Um, actually, sort of extending that a little bit, quite surprised at how well Russell's done in that battle at the start of this season. Actually, I think it's 2 0 in qualifying and 2 uh, 0 in the races. It is indeed. So, good start to the season for George Russell, especially when you compare it to. Uh, his tricky year last year. I think a really good start, but I would hope that Hamilton's close to Russell in Melbourne. Um, I can't know for sure, but I, I that's a battle I really enjoy. But then at the same time, I kind of like the uh, the mix-up of Mercedes and McLaren in that little four-way fight we've got there. And I, I, I yeah, kind of want to keep that going. But, you know, Hamilton had his problems this weekend. They left him out, didn't they? Because he was uh second on the road they didn't want to double stack so that's compromised his race that maybe swings it that way but russell russell's been good third would he qualify third in bahrain as well didn't he Stuart? so he's had a good start to the season but you'd you'd expect it to be closer between them two 
as the races progress this season. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, Russell's just been been pretty solid. Hamilton just wasn't happy all weekend um, here. He said it. I think we all, we all knew it. It looks like it's going to be an off, off weekend for him. I, I've already said I kind of don't expect Mercedes to be great in Melbourne based on this i mean i i, I could be wrong it's we, we're all going to find out together <laughs> um but i think i think they will be closer and i think they'll co- continue to be closer i think russell's seizing an op well seizing an opportunity or seeing that he really has to hammer home that he's going to be the team leader when hamilton leaves so i think he's i don't know i do think maybe russell has a like a sense of of confidence from Hamilton leaving of feeling like okay I can I can step up here I can make this team my own I can I don't have to really necessarily worry about Lewis too much while knowing that whoever they bring in he's going to have to you know um he's going to have to have the power of the team when when a new person comes in especially if there's someone like a a, a hot driver like I don't know Maybe Alonso, maybe uh, Science. I feel like Science is the is the best pick right now. But yeah, I think I, th- I think Russell seems in a good place mentally right now. <laughs> Again, sample size of two. Yeah, th- no, I think it's a good point because I think it's it's not that he doesn't have to compare himself to Hamilton because obviously if he gets absolutely destroyed by Lewis this season, then the team are going to look for a number one driver rather than somebody to come in and and back him up. But he, he can sort of almost focus on himself, can't he? And and almost if he wants to build that team around him because you know Lewis Hamilton seven time world champion people will go well surely Mercedes build around him but they won't this season because there's no point so the effort will go to Russell um in that regard so he can try and get that team around him before anybody else comes in and the best way to do that is to perform and outperform your teammates so I think that's a factor that's definitely a factor but again two races anything could happen um, I just look at Albert Park because you said about your concerns there. It's, you know, Mercedes next weekend turns sort of the exit of turn six all the way to turn nine is flat out, fast left, fast right, still fast right, fast left. And then you've got the fast chicane, haven't you, at nine and ten. Then it's another long run with a kink. And then, yeah, it's it's a it's a fast track. So they might struggle next weekend. So, so to answer um, the question, um, I think Hamilton probably will be closer to Russell, but I can see with the issues at high speed, maybe Russell going backwards a little bit as well. Um, they, might, they might meet in the middle somewhere, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> we'll see how that all works out. Um, Pascal says, do you think Bottas will still be in F1 next year? Joe seems to be quicker this year so far. Uh, and do you think Sainz will come to Sauber Audi next year? Um, so on the, the Audi thing, first thing, we talked about this last week. Um, we were concerned because there were some rumours, weren't there, about them pulling out. Turns out that's not the case at all. Uh, they've committed i think they've they've either committed to the 100 percent of sabre or they've that's gone through um so i don't know if Stuart knows for sure on that one but they've definitely it looks like that's going to happen um yeah and i thought sites to audi might be a bit of a shoe in because obviously the connection that carlos sites senior has there but if there's a seat open at red bull or a seat open at mercedes it's a big gamble to potentially if he has a good season turn one of those down and go to a, what would be effectively a new team like Audi, a new manufacturer, a new engine. It'd be a, it'd be a big gamble. So he might, he might not. Um, it feels like a nice fit with Andreas Seidel there, um, but I'm not convinced. Just on your other point, um, actually, I've got, I've got my spreadsheet up, Stuart. It's very exciting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> obviously, I can't compare the lap times in Saudi because um, Joe didn't do one. Uh, in qualifying but in qualifying in Bahrain there was a thousandth of a second between them uh, so they are definitely close uh, and Joe seems to be a little bit faster in that regard but he, he, I think Joe's another driver who doesn't get a lot of credit and I don't know if that's because he's not doing anything spectacular he's just doing a decent job I don't know but I think I think he's done all right at Sauber these last two years, and I think he's he's when you consider how good Bottas was in qualifying, for example, against Lewis Hamilton and, and some of the things he did at Mercedes, I think Joe can hold his head very high. Um, again, he's not doing anything 
spectacular to put himself in the frame for a, a Red Bull seat or a Mercedes seat or anything bonkers like that. Um, but I think he's doing a good job. That picture that's just cropped up, by the way, you know that's been used in tire talk in a preview at some point. Uh, <laughs> that face on Charles Leclerc <laughs> is brilliant. But yeah, no, I, I like Joe. I think he's doing well. But on Bottas next year, if Audi can't get a science, for example, maybe they keep him for the experience. But if it's not Sauber next year or Audi next year or 26, you know what I mean? Um, where does Bottas see himself? Where's he, where's he going to go, Stuart? Because... If he doesn't stay at Sauber next year for the Audi project the following year, could he return somewhere like Williams maybe? But then they've got young drivers of their own and Mercedes have got some young drivers they're not going to do deals with to get them there. Antonelli, for example, or uh, Vesti or a Schumacher. But I, if it's not Sauber, I'm not really sure where Bottas goes. Yeah, he's one of those drivers in the... Uh, on the bubble, I guess, to put it in qualifying terms. He's the, he's a driver at risk because you, you have got these potential drivers coming through and they're going to have to go somewhere and he's not you know i like i like botas i like botas a lot i think he's i think he's solid but he's sort of like at that point in his career where he's not uh, he's he's not um hot enough in value to necessarily be desperate to hang on to i think and in terms of getting someone either getting someone younger in that seat who's a lot cheaper but has a lot of potential might be a, a better idea or just trying to grab someone from, from elsewhere in the, on, on, in the grid who, who might be a better bet for you, I think. So yeah, I think, I think boss has definitely one of those drivers you could see possibly disappearing next year. He's a, he's, he's sort of at that point now where you could see better options. I've got nothing against him, but there, you know, there's a lot of drivers out there young and old. Um, and that team is also looking to build, so, yeah, this, 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 yeah, I can't guarantee he'll be around next year. I can't predict the silly season because every time we've tried, it's <laughs> it's not gone well. But yeah, I, I, you know, if Bottas sort of just just kind of, I think it's kind of passive, just kind of passively found himself without a seat next year, I wouldn't be totally shocked. Well, yeah, the, the silly season stuff. I mean, the Verstappen thing to Mercedes went a bit quiet after um, it turned out how Marco was staying, um, and then. Toto Wolf came out and said that he wouldn't, that he'd love to have Verstappen as a, a driver. And everyone went, oh my God, it's happening. And it's like, could you name me a, a team on the grid that wouldn't love to have Verstappen as a driver? Yeah. <laughs> it's just such a nothing comment. And it, I, I do like watching uh, Twitter and then looking at um, some of the, let's say, clickbaitier uh, news outlets, your aggregator sites, for example, sort of getting in this massive flat because Toto Wolf said he'd love to have Verstappen in his car. It's like, yeah, but, you know which team wouldn't it's it's just a nothing it's a nothing it's a non-committal comment isn't it he's, he's not committing to anything he's just saying yeah Verstappen's a cracking driver wouldn't mind having him in my car uh but that that doesn't mean anything so um I mean I, I stand by what I said last week I don't believe that so I didn't believe it was ever going to happen um I still think if Verstappen leaves Red Bull he probably just leaves F1 and goes and does a bit of whack or something goes for the triple crown perhaps or whatever um I, oh, did so you see I the race fans headline by the way on how they, that? they headlined that it was something along the lines of Verstappen pushes aside sim racing to win Saudi Arabia Grand Prix. <laughs> That's not such a really cool way to frame it. <laughs> like like F1's this side hustle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bless him. I, I, I think, again, this is like has a 0% chance. Well, has a 0.1% chance of happening. I think in terms of drama possibly on track action and just 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 re something really meaty i think the best thing that could happen in terms of silly season was obviously hamilton goes to ferrari uh verstappen goes to mercedes and then science goes to red bull i think that would be that'd pretty be sweet for for 2025 i think that'd be a lot of fun um i'll uh i'll make a wish i don't, I don't know what i'm pausing waiting for you to blow out your candles or something <laughs> 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 um Vesk says should we believe the hype about Antonelli personally it sounds wild to me that Lewis going to Ferrari was in part because of a driver who wasn't even in F2 F3 yet uh, not saying he's bad but it's weird it's a bit it's a big call from Mercedes um to be because I think unless I'm wrong correct me in chat if I'm wrong or Stuart can correct me as well it was something along the lines of 
Toto Wolf didn't want to give Lewis Hamilton a long-term contract because he wanted to see what Antonelli was doing. He didn't want to be in a position like he was with some of the other junior drivers where he had nowhere to put them and then he lost them to other other teams. So um, it makes sense, but it does seem, I agree, it seems wild to do that to, you know, the driver that is your top driver, your 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 world champion. Um, it's kind of crazy. But the, the hype around Antonelli, I think I said when I did my Mercedes option video that, and I kind of stand by this, that if he has a good effort, if, if the plan is to put Antonelli in that Mercedes in 2026, whatever happens, I feel you may as well put him in next year, give him that year to get up to speed, settle in at the team, understand F1, get to know the tracks, get to know the car, get to know the team inside out. And then he's ready for 2026, which is why I said, you know, if he has a good F2 season and you're going to put him in the car anyway, go for it. But I still think Mercedes will looking at how they've dealt with young drivers in the past, probably prefer to put Antonelli at, say, a Williams and then bring in an Alonso as a short-term option, for example, um, which is probably what I would do if I was being sensible. But if I was being wild and really wanting to to give youth a chance, then um, I'd just chuck Antonelli in there and, you know, <laughs> I'd, I'd be and signing think... up Behrman if I was Red Bull and I'd have Liam Lawson and God knows what. <laughs> you know, don't, don't ever let me take control of driver transfers because it'll be a disaster. I think if um, if Russell really proves himself this year and so if Mercedes knew, okay, we absolutely know Russell can deliver. If we give him a good car, he'll get podiums and wins or whatever. Like Russell's going to get close to the maximum of what, what this car can do. So we feel safe putting an Antonelli in the second seat to to get him to give him a good learning year and not throw away the whole season. If Russell has a year this year where he's sort of making mistakes or feels like he's still I don't know in it where, where they not necessarily feel like uh, if if they're maybe a little bit worried about him and thinking ah maybe he's not going to be the future of this team then then maybe they'll get someone in who's a bit more solid so the twenty twenty five doesn't doesn't fall apart it'd be interesting to see what they do where they heads at uh, but to you were right at the beginning what you said toto wolf was like we don't want to lose antonelli we don't want to lose the option of antonelli which is why they gave him the one plus one contract to, to hamilton which ultimately led to him walking away so yeah keeping an eye on antonelli is going to be an interesting one he's had a sort of stumbling stumbling's a bit unfair but he's had a, a tricky start so far premier didn't have a very good bahrain and he's still definitely learning and i think the second half of the year is really going to show where he's at it's uh it's he has taken a big step as well though hasn't he to skip f3 and straight into f2 it's and then to go straight into f1 yeah. that'll be i think whatever happens from here it's a gamble for mercedes isn't it but um i have closed the poll by the way uh rate the 2024 saudi arabian grand prix three percent thought it was great oh, good um, i'm glad you enjoyed nine percent said bad 28 percent said good and 58 percent said average slash okay i put the slash okay in because people think that average is a bad thing it's not it's just an okay race and that's sort of how i i see that better than bahrain but you know not enough to rate it as a great race for me but I, like you say Stuart, it's good that people enjoy that and i think there is there's always something to look out for in f1 i think and and there are the odd races that there isn't it goes a bit <laughs> stale but even in bahrain we had the the Sonoda Ricardo stuff, didn't we? Which which kept us entertained towards the end, and everything with Magnussen on Saturday was good. So I think, yeah, okay, is a a fair rating, I would say. Pascal, by the way, says dream team for Sauber for for him is Sainz and Hulk. Um, if not Sainz, then Hulk and Porsche, who's racing in Super nice. Formula, isn't he, this year? So uh, see how he gets on there. Um, the max is three percent of viewers are Behrman's dad. <laughs> <laughs> but actually just on that how interesting now is that you know the Behrman Antonelli fight was interesting anyway but now Behrman's had that one race chance in F1 and done so well that's now even more interesting isn't it the, the Behrman Antonelli thing so I'm quite looking forward to that and just sort of going back to my point that I was going to make earlier um, whilst waiting for some more questions to come in you know we're talking about those six FP1 sessions with Haas for um, Behrman but after that performance, and if he continues that in in F two and has a strong year and maybe contends, you know, contest the title, um, why why could he not potentially be linked somewhere else? Could you know? Could as I said earlier, could if he doesn't get a seat with Haas and Ferrari can't find him anywhere? Could RB go in and Red Bull go in and buy out his contract and put him in 
one of those RBs alongside, for example, Liam Lawson. You know, I don't think that's a terrible suggestion. Red Bull aren't afraid to go and pick up other people's junior drivers if they need to, to fill a spot. So, um, but that, that goes back to me just thinking that RB just, I wish they'd just embrace that they were a junior team um, because that's kind of how I see them. I think many people see them that way. And, and we saw with it not working with Gasly, it not really working with Albon and then having to go and get Perez. And now they've been linked again with Science, who was, of course, a Red Bull junior, but we're not seeing that promotion through RB really anymore, are we? So it'd be nice to see a couple of youngsters in there, like they used to do, you know, with Jev and Buemi and Al Jaswari and Bourdais and, and that. Who was that other kid? Um, uh, Max Verstappen. I don't know what he's done since then. <laughs> um, you know, bring them through. I'd quite like to see that. So, you know, RB is a proper, a proper junior team. Lawson and... I don't know, if not, I forgot his name, Behrman, there it is. If not Behrman, then maybe, you know, go find Antonelli if Mercedes can't find him a seat. But um, I, I'm not, no, if, if it, I, I feel like I'm putting the pressure on now, even though he won't be listening. But <laughs> on poor Ollie Behrman, like the expectation now that he must, he must be in contention for a seat a bit further up than Haas. But, you know, F1 experience, cut his teeth at the back. It's worked for many drivers over the years, hasn't it? So, yeah, I think, I think there's also an important thing to just, Ease him in gently. He had a really great baptism, best, uh, baptism of fire, but I think, um, like, so did Nick de Vries. and he sort of that kind of fell apart underneath him when he <laughs> when he uh, got to do well a full season, but an attempted full season. There, you know, there are there are there are some drivers that you just need to just not overhype him too much and, and then push him too hard by the time he does get an F one seat. But I think. Whether it's Red Bull or, or whoever uh, and RB, we do need to get this kind of pipeline of junior drivers flowing again. They've been they've been kind of a bit um, stuck for a, quite a few years now, and it was interesting to hear Anthony Davison say on the Friday before Berman got in the car that all the F two drivers are really want him to do well because they want him they want him to prove that they can step into an F one seat and deliver and you can take a chance on them and, and, and move them up because they, they know how hard it is to, to, to move from F2 to F1 now. It's not, it's not a guarantee. So, and it was nice to actually watch the F2 drivers uh, celebrate him as he did well in qualifying and watching on the screens and stuff. It was, it was, there was a really nice atmosphere at it. So yeah, the, the, could you say fallout if it's something positive? I was gonna say the fallout from Behrman's weekend is going to be interesting to, to see both for him and for the wider, world of moving these younger drivers up yeah i agree no fallouts are fair yeah i know what you mean i, I know the negative <laughs> side of that but no i know what consequences? you're saying yeah the consequences <laughs> probably yeah possibly better yeah even consequences sounds a bit negative doesn't it when you say it weird um, <laughs> when i say it I, I mean one thing positive about fallout is that they're putting all episodes of the new series that's coming out in april on amazon prime at the same time so i can binge that um so there you go uh, <laughs> <laughs> we got there we did it um thank Not you sponsored. <laughs> yeah, yeah hashtag ad um thank you very much to jonathan for uh signing up over on patreon um to support the channel long term thank you very much uh appreciate that uh, as always you can do that if you want to it links in the description all of that but it's cool if not do you want a couple of bad puns stuart always yes uh del says porsche should only ever drive for porsche Porsche, Porsche, yeah. Very nice. Uh, and John Very says, nice. if Porsche gets a bad seat like Alpine, can we make the joke that he's got his name? Porsche seat, Alpine. It's... Mm. <laughs> that Porsche, that's a poor joke. <laughs> <laughs> Puns are supposed to be bad, aren't they? So we'll, we'll let them... Yeah, we'll, we'll, let, we'll let that one go. Uh, results. Yes, there you go. Red Raver says the results of Behrman's weekend yeah yeah that yeah yeah thank you that'll do um have we got any quick fire questions at all we'll, or if not we'll wrap up because uh we're we going a little bit like it was quite again six pages of notes i had to do it some of it was directions for me to remind me you know to put slides on a loop rather than just letting them end uh, but you know <laughs> it's, it's a lot of, i think there was a lot to talk about there but there were a couple of are we using the word controversies i suppose they were weren't they, they were controversial so um uh, Wincap says, did I hear hashtag ad? This, this really reminds me of Saudi Arabia's uh, incredible new circuit. Hashtag play life. 
Do you, do you think they're going to build that, Stuart? Do you think that's actually, if anywhere's going to, it's going to be Saudi Arabia or a Dubai, isn't it? Or something that somewhere like that is. I just. I... Yeah, I mean, my, my heart says, of course they're not going to build it. That's ludicrous. What? Who's asking for this? But then they're also building a city that's in a straight line for like 10 miles or whatever. Like they're just building a, a big a one dimensional <laughs> city. So who knows? They, they they build whatever they want out there with with all the money they have. Um, good good luck to them. I don't think anyone's asking for it. What I think everyone has called a Mario Kart circuit, but especially one that goes up and over a building, as far as I can understand. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. They'll probably surprise us all. I mean, Josie says they've broken ground on it. I, I have no doubt they'll build the circuit. I'm just not convinced that turn one or whatever it is, that what they call it, the blade. Got to call it blade. <laughs> no. That's, blade. That's, everything that's, everything that's is a gimmick crofty. now, doesn't it? Oh, crofty. It's going to be a nightmare. I thought, oh, it's not turn one, it's the blade. We have to call it the blade. Uh, <laughs> you know what he's like. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I have no doubt they'll build the track. I'm just not convinced that court. But then if they do, then it's something isn't it but i'm just not not convinced but i mean where do you stop could, could we build the um the secret volcano track that was on f1 97 i think it was video game or 98 <laughs> build that one you know why not drive through a volcano uh we'll, we'll see we'll see but you know, like i say if anyone's gonna be able to do it it'll be it'll be there so um i don't know it, it's bonkers to me i was gonna say something it's completely gone now Oh, yeah, uh, F1 Academy. Someone asked about F1 Academy. Uh, Pascal, did you watch any of the F1 Academy? I watched the second race um, and then spent way too long laughing at the scenarios in my head that <laughs> Pan just kept going. You know, she went past my house. <laughs> she just didn't seem to stop. Um, a lot of anger about the decision to uh, penalise her for that. Um, and, and by anger, I mean stupid idiots on social media who feel the need to throw abuse because... <laughs> yeah i said it that's social media there you go uh twitter in particular but i i i don't really see the controversy I, I understand the team didn't tell her the race finished but there was a flag that you know others saw and stopped and it's just a mistake isn't it and you know she's made the mistake she's paid the price and that's not anybody else's fault that she made that mistake well you could when I mean, you could argue the team should have said uh i should have maybe spent a bit less time celebrating or whatever they were doing rather than telling her but um yeah. I get that it, I get that it's dangerous and John T will hate me for laughing at it, but it was dangerous, but it, it was also it did just give me so many funny images in my head of just this I don't know what kind of music I had in my head as well that she just kept going and going. You know, F F one starts, but there's there's Dorian still going and going and going. <laughs> I don't know why it was funny to me, it just was, but uh, a, sh a shame because I mean she drove brilliantly all weekend, didn't she? Yeah, she did. Yeah. I mean she's a she is another class, really. Um, like quite literally. Um but yeah, it did a great job. It was a shame to have it taken away from her, but I feel like the, the point she lost here, she will get back again. Um, lovely to see Abby pulling actually give her a challenge, though. Um, I, hopefully she'll be able to get a win for herself at some point. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I like you. I thought it was... <laughs> dangers aside, luckily, like no one was on the track at the time, but yeah, that, that, that she just sort of kept tooling on. I did wonder how long she would have gone um, if they hadn't have told her. I suppose, you know, in terms of being disqualified and things, I think there is a very real, you need to be quite serious if you're not looking at flags, even if they are the checkered flag. I think that's something. Um, I saw some stills that made it look like maybe the checkered flag was in a in a place that wasn't easily seen. And you know, their dashboards on the cars are not the same as F1. So it's not like they get instant um, virtual flags on their steering wheels and so on. But yeah, uh, bit of an error. Um, her and the team won't make it. Again, I, I'm pretty sure next race there will be shouting into the radio. It's stopped, by the way. The race is over. Please come home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, but quite quite an enjoyable race, as I thought. Uh, Josie says she couldn't see the flag, uh, and pulling herself said that she only knew it ended when she saw the the blocking on the flag. Uh, the flag board had changed. Um, Del says she'll win every other race anyway. Lol. Uh, <laughs> probably. Uh, yeah. No. It's like you say. We're, it'll not happen again it was it was dangerous but these things happen but at the same time it's such a you know whether she could see the flag or not it's such a fundamental thing isn't it the the end of a race that you can't you take the flag twice you're going to be penalized and it's one of those just don't do it again 
Um, and like you say, Stuart, they'll be screaming on the radio next time. Make sure that it doesn't. But I'm, I'm not going to go hard on anyone for that because I don't think it's necessary. And it's certainly not necessary to then go and hurl vile messages at the person who inherited the win. Um, no, they didn't. Strange do reaction. But, you know, people. Um, one last one then, and then we will wrap up. Um, I saw someone asking for uh, Red Raven asked me watching Weck. I'm not, um, which will appall some of you, I'm sure. Did watch IndyCar. That was good fun, um, as always. Um, how about Liam Lawson, says Kevin N. Oh, don't. I, look, final point on driver transfers. I still, I look at that grid. I look particularly at RB and I think, really? <laughs> He's just there. <laughs> you know, you're taking it to the weekends anyway. And I know I'm biased. I know, I, you know, I know I'm biased towards Liam Lawson, but um, I just think you're a junior team, allegedly, or, or depending how they feel that week. Some weeks they're a junior team, some weeks they're not for some reason. Uh, but they're, they're effectively a junior team. You've got a driver there who did a cracking job when he stood in for Daniel Ricciardo. Um, I think, I want to get the stats up now, but he wasn't far off Sonoda in some areas as well. I'd just have him in that car over at least one of them two. Uh, but that's not, I, I, you know, I defend Yuki a lot and I like Daniel Ricciardo, but I just think, I don't know. <laughs> Let's not get into it. Let's not get into it. I, I, I can't, I can't. Uh, but thank you very much, Stuart. It's been, uh, it's been cracking <laughs> as always. A little bit longer tonight, but there was actually quite a bit to, to talk about. It wasn't just, you know, Red Bull were great. Um, what else happened? I think there's quite a lot going on there. So, okay, race. Um, looking forward to Australia. I was going to say this, actually. Australia, to me, always feels like the proper start to the season because for so long it was the start of the season. So maybe maybe Bahrain, Saudi, the dress rehearsal, everyone's got their eye in now and Australia will be, you know, five-team fight for the win and anyone... No, no, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but there's always a chance. There's always a chance. Yes. fingers. It's a good track, though. I do, I do like it. Not maybe the best for overtaking, but I do... Just feels like the start of the season. So um, thank you very much, Stuart. And um, I'm sure I'll talk to you um, shortly. Enjoy enjoy a week without F1, if you can. How can I? Can I just want it every week. <laughs> Forever. 50 races, please. <laughs> uh, yeah, lovely talking to you. I will we'll chat again. Yes, definitely. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Stuart. Thank you to you guys as well uh, for tuning in. Um, just to reiterate again, as I said earlier, these will go back to being the day out. Well, these will be the day after the race in future because we're back to sort of normality. Um, obviously, early races for the next few in the UK and Europe, which is fine. I enjoy those because then you've got the rest of your day to sleep on the sofa. Uh, but yeah, so previews Thursday um, and then on the Monday, straight after the race, it'll be the debrief these streams so i think as i said i think sighted canvas said it in it'll in chat it'll work better and it'll flow better once we're back to normal uh weekend structure so that's uh that's hopefully how it'll work out and again you know if they fail miserably then we'll we'll try something else that's the way it goes um gotta try things why not uh so i will be back uh, with some more content soon there will be videos between races this year i've just got to decide what i'm doing with those uh, i just want to get the first two races out the out of the way first uh, before we get into the season proper and of course there will be the preview for the australian grand prix uh, on thursday the 20 it's nearly my birthday at that point so thursday the 21st uh, of march and of course the debrief will be monday the 25th of march um so hopefully you'll join me for that one you can follow me on social media links are not in the description but it's at f1 word and f1 word pretty much everywhere where i have socials <laughs> it's the way i'm gonna word that one um and don't forget to drop a like on the stream as well before you go uh, and please do subscribe if you're new because it'd be great to have you on board sorry i just uh, had to take a breath there uh, it'd be great to have you on board uh, for the rest of the season um but as ever Thank you for watching. I've been Sean. This has been the F1 Word. And until next time, goodbye.